Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Are you warm and toasty or are you freezing? <laughs> freezing. <laughs> Stand to worship with us this morning. We'll try to make it warm in here. <laughs> Worship the Lord this morning. I hope you are. It's good to see you in the house of God this morning. I was trying to make it around to everybody today, and I don't think I did just to welcome you, but thank you for being here. Glad to see some uh, faces we hadn't seen in a while. Amen. Glad to see some folks here that hadn't been here in a while. Glad that you're doing better. I know we've had a lot of sickness uh, going around. I saw Miss Rachel here this morning. Linda and Riley's here. It's good to see all of you. Miss Ray Jean is with us this morning. Good to see all of you. All of you. Give yourselves a hand clap this morning. Amen. You're here, and I hope you're ready to worship the Lord this morning. Uh, I'm just uh, I'm excited today. I've got a word from the Lord today. It is a what I think is a if we will receive the word, it is a powerful word for us. We're going to continue in our series on the uh, power in the name of Jesus. Uh, and there's going to be a time at the end of service for you to receive prayer if you so desire and if you need it. Uh, and I hope that you will. Uh, I'm ready to worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Man, we have completed day oh, day one. Good Lord. Week one, I'm starting all the way over. Week one of our fast yesterday, of our 21-day fast. And I know some of you are ahead of us because you had to start earlier than we did for, other, for, uh, so for personal reasons. Uh, so when you're finished before us, I don't want to see no pictures. 
I don't want to hear about what you ate because I don't care. Okay? I want to hear about it. Keep that to yourself. And, and at the right time, the Lord will prompt you to release your information. Amen? Once we all finished and we all can eat. Amen? I hope you are, uh, I hope you, if you are, uh, if you've been on the fast, it, it, I don't know if it's been challenged. First week's not usually that challenging from a food standpoint. It can get that way going forward. Uh, but it, it's going to be challenging from a spiritual standpoint. Anytime you fast and anytime you pray, the enemy is going to show up. He is going to try to counteract everything you're doing. He's going to try to break your wheel. He's going to try to get you to give in and give up and, and turn back and not finish and not do what God's prompted you to do. But I want to encourage you this morning that when you feel that, that nudging of the enemy and you're in those situations where you feel him pressing against you, be joyous. Rejoice. Because it's in those moments you know you're making an advancement on his kingdom. It's in those moments you know that you're doing the right thing and you're heading in the right direction because the enemy is not going to counteract what you're doing unless you're doing something that's going to harm him. So keep fasting, keep praying, keep reading your word, keep worshiping. Come to Monday night prayer. That is a wonderful time. I tell, I said this the other week and people, some people may not have liked it, but I said Monday night is my favorite service of the week. And the reason why Monday night is my favorite service of the week is not that it's just that we, we pray together for an hour. That is part of it. But we worship together for an hour. We will worship. We'll be, man, there'll be people in here singing. I mean, it's music playing. Ain't nobody playing on the stage. But they're singing and they're worshiping and they're just rejoicing. And it's just a great time that the Lord meets with us here. So I encourage you, six to seven, it's one hour of your day. One hour. And you don't even have to stay the whole hour. We, most, most, most people do. Most people stay the whole hour. But you don't have to. You come and pray and, and just interact with God, speak with the Lord, and just allow the Lord to speak with you. Amen. Wednesday nights, of course, through the fast is kind of like our first Wednesdays. We're doing a, a ser I call it a sermonette. It's really more than a sermonette, but it's not a full sermon. Um, and then we spend some time, 20 minutes or so, in prayer together again. I think it's important that we corporately pray together if we're going to corporately fast together. Amen. If you're praying and not fasting, let me rephrase that. If you're fasting and not praying, you're just doing a bad diet. It's going to be painful and it's going to be hard. But if you accompany your fasting with prayer, it'll make the difference in your life. Amen? Amen. I'm glad to see you today. Those that join us on Facebook, thank you for being here today. Make sure you're inviting people to church. Evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. Pastor, what does that mean? That means tell people about Jesus. And invite them to the house of God. Lead them to Jesus. You don't have to bring them here to get saved. You can lead them to Jesus yourself. But bring them to the house of God that we might make disciples. Amen. That is our calling. That is what God has commanded us to do. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Let's make sure that we are proactive in doing that. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. They're going to come lead us in worship together. And I just pray that, uh, that you will just allow the Lord to begin to minister to you and through you this morning. Just cast everything else out of your mind, all the worries, all the troubles, all the things you may have to face tomorrow, all the things you may be going through or coming up on the horizon. Just put them aside for just the next few handful of minutes and just focus on God this morning and allow God to minister to you. Amen. Let's do that together this morning. Father, we thank you for your grace and goodness. We thank you for the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Lord, we've assembled ourselves together here today to fellowship with you, to fellowship with one another, to hear the word of God, to encounter you today, to have you speak to us, to minister to us, to have your hand upon our lives today. Father, we need a touch of God. We need the moving of the Holy Ghost in us this morning. Now, Father, I just ask you today to have your way in this house. Now, Lord, you would speak what needs to be spoken. You would do what needs to be done. You would move what needs to be moved. You would uproot whatever needs to be uprooted. And you would plant whatever needs to be planted, that it might bring life to your people and bring life to your church. Now, Father, I give all glory and honor and praise to you for all that will be done and has been done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and give all honor. And everybody said... Amen. Turn around, shake somebody's hand, wave at them, nod at them, do something. Just welcome them to the house of God this morning.
Amen. Can you just worship the Lord for a minute this morning? You know, Matthew 5, I believe it is, says, They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. It speaks of a desperation. And I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you this morning, church. This is not my sermon. I'm going to get to it in a minute. But I'm going to be honest with you this morning. There needs to be a desperation in this house. There needs to be a desperation in each of us today. Because we're entering a season in the history of, of the church, not this church in, uh, individually, but the church as a whole, that the real church and the church that has formed out of her is going to be uh, realized. And the real church will be, will be noted and determined by the desperation within them to encounter the presence and the power of God. That, that the real church will be the church that is so in love with Jesus that nothing else matters. Amen. Listen to me. You may not agree with this, and that's your right. But I'm going to tell you this morning, we are coming quick to a dividing moment in the church of Jesus Christ that if we, are, if we continue down a path of as is rather than a path of desperation in seeking God, hungering and thirsting after His presence, we may never notice the difference, but there's going to be a difference. And the difference is going to be is that the presence of the Lord will not be with that church anymore. Listen to me. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Like it or not like it. You go read the book of Revelation and Revelation 2 and he tells them. In Revelation 3 he goes on over. We're going to talk about this in a couple Sundays. I'm, God gave me a sermon, a word this morning. As I sat in my office preparing for today. Gave me a word this morning for two weeks from today called the autopsy of a dead church. And we're going to talk about that very thing. about, about we, we need to have a passion, a desperation. We live in an hour of this world that we should be desperate for Jesus. Chaos is everywhere. The coming of Christ is soon to happen. And we can't afford as a church or as a people or as individuals to be apathetic anymore. We can't, we can't, we can't risk just complacency anymore. We've got to have a hunger for the righteousness of God. You know what is the righteousness of God? It is Christ Jesus. And we've got to have a hunger and a thirsting within us. Each of us. Each of us. For the, for the, for the person of and the glory of Jesus Christ. I hope, I hope that you do. I hope that you do. Or these next couple of weeks are going to be very uncomfortable. Because we're just going to lay it out. And I'm going to lay it out starting this Wednesday night. We're going to talk about pursuing. And we're going to talk about some hard things Wednesday night. And, and so I want you to be here because we, we, need to, we need to hear. We need to hear the truth and we need to hear some hard things. And we're going to hear them starting Wednesday night. And then we're going to lead into that sermon on, on the 28th of this month called The Autopsy of a Dead Church. We need to see what happens when we lose our passion and we lose our zeal for the Lord. This morning we're going to be in the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, 38th verse, same scripture we opened with last week. Don't lose your enthusiasm that you had in worship. This morning, we need to be enthusiastic. We need to be exuberant in our worship. There should be life in us. You know why there should be life in us? Because God's not dead. Amen. We don't serve a dead God. Well, our God's not buried in the side of a hill somewhere. Our God is resurrected. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem because Jesus got up. Because he's alive and he's well. And so for us to be uh, downcast, oh my soul, and, 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 and all of that, we don't need to be that way. We should be joyous. We should be happy. We should be exuberant in our praise and our worship of God because he is alive. And because he lives, we shall live also. Amen. Amen. Acts 10 verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power... And how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the touch of your hand this morning. For the moving of your spirit. We thank you that you are with us now. Now, Father, touch me as I endeavor to preach the word this morning. That the anointing of God would come upon me. That my words would not be mine, but they would be yours. That you would speak through me today. Anoint your people to hear the word this morning. That they might receive it with gladness and joy. That Lord it might transform who we are. And how we are. And what we are today. That you might receive all glory. And you might receive all the honor. For it is due to none but you. And Father today we give you glory for all. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this morning. So we're going to continue this morning in our look at the power in the name of Jesus. Now last week we, we looked at the power of Jesus' name to save. That there's no other way to heaven except through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And Paul, writing to the church in Rome, wrote, he wrote, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So we can with certainty this morning say there is power only in one name to save, and that is in the name of Jesus Christ. This morning I want to shift our attention a little bit to something else the name of Jesus has the power to perform in our lives. And that there is power in the name of Jesus to heal. Acts 3 verse 1 and 2 says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. I want you to underline the beginning of verse 2 there. It doesn't even mention his name. It just says a man. Who was lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms or to ask money from those who entered the temple. Now, the Bible says he had been lame from his mother's womb. So his affliction was not of his own doing. It wasn't his fault. He hadn't done anything to cause the situation that he was in. There was, it was not self-inflicted. It wasn't an accident. and uh, There wasn't uh, something that somebody else did to him to place him in this predicament or in this condition. It was, it was life. It was just life. The Bible said he was born the way that he was. He didn't do it. Nobody did it to him. It's life. Life can be unfair, but it is life. And sometimes, I know this may shock you, but sometimes life stinks. Sometimes it does. Sometimes life is hard. And oftentimes life isn't fair. But it's life. While Often what you have to endure may not be fair. It may not be what you would prefer or what you would want. But it is what you've got. And we can't change that. You have but one life. There's things that you will never be able to change about your life. But you have life. And you are where you are because that is where life has you. Now it is what it is. But that don't mean God can't minister to you where you are. Now, I know that sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. Anybody else or just me? Just me. Okay. Feel like I'm on an island up here. Sometimes we get ourselves into situations and it's nobody's fault but our own. Sometimes life is hard because we make bad decisions. Sometimes things are rough because we do the wrong thing. Sometimes it is absolutely our fault for where we are. Amen. We can all, we all grown, we can admit our mistakes, I hope. But there are times that you will find yourself in the middle of a situation that you just can't explain. You don't know how you got there. You don't know what happened. You may have had nothing to do with how you got there. You may not be responsible for where you are. But here's the thing we need to remember and need to learn today. We do bear responsibility for how we respond once we are there. Now, you may not have put yourself in that pit. You might not have placed yourself in that situation. You may not have done whatever's happened to you. And you can't change that part. But what you can change is how you respond to what has happened to you. What happened to you doesn't have to become who you are. So you can't help what happened to you then, but you can help how you allow it to affect you now. Now let's look at verse 2 again. It says, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily. He was born lame, or born without the ability to walk. And every day he depended on somebody to pick him up and carry him to the temple, lay him at the gate beautiful, that he might beg from the worshippers alms or money that he could survive off of. So they laid him daily at the gates of the temple, which is called beautiful. To beg alms or to ask alms from those who entered the temple. And here's what I want us to see this morning. Don't allow what happens to you to define who you are. 
Things are going to happen to you in life, but they don't have to become who you are. The scripture reads, a certain lame man, he was not identified by his name, but rather by his affliction. And when people saw him, they wouldn't have called him by name like you and I could call each other by name. Rather, they would, they would say, isn't that the lame man from the temple? Isn't that the lame man, the one who was born lame? The Bible refers to him as a certain lame man. It didn't even mention his name. His affliction had become who he was. It had become his identity. And if we aren't careful, the things we go through in life, the sickness, the tragedies, the heartache, the struggles, the pain, the suffering, or whatever it may be, we we will allow the afflictions and troubles of this life to become who we are. It becomes our identity. It becomes how we are known. See, there are going to be storms that roll into and out of our lives. Whether it was your fault or not, it does not have to be who you are. It does not have to define you. It does not have to become who you are today. You're going to struggle in life. There are going to be hard times. There's going to be sickness. You're going to have pain. You're going to have suffering. You're going to have hills to climb. You're going to have valleys to transverse. You're going to have things in your life that just stink and they're not pleasant. We don't like them. We don't want them. But they're going to be there. But how you handle what you're there will determine whether or not it becomes who you are. See, those struggles and afflictions don't have to become your identity. You don't have to be defined by your circumstances or identified by your afflictions. You know, if you were to look over in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, around verse 49 or 50, you would see there that there's another man who was identified By his condition. His name was blind Bartimaeus. Everybody's heard of blind Bartimaeus. We've heard the script. We've read it. We've probably heard sermons preached on blind Bartimaeus. It's obvious to us. Or at least it should be. What blind Bartimaeus issue was. He could not see. He was blind. And blind Bartimaeus had grown weary of allowing his condition to be the definition of who he was. See, there are some who revel in their condition being their identity. It's their crutch in life. It's what they want to be known as. But Bartimaeus was tired of it. He was tired of being identified as a beggar. He was tired of being identified as blind Bartimaeus than just Bartimaeus. He was tired of his affliction being his identity. And Bartimaeus was sitting on the roadside begging for money when he heard a crowd of people. He heard a crowd of people coming toward where he was. And when he learned that it was Jesus of Nazareth, something changed inside of him. And the Bible said he began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. See, Bartimaeus had learned, presumably because of what he had heard or seen, that Jesus had the power to change his identity. And he was not going to keep quiet about it. He was not just going to sit there like a good little church boy on the pew. And just be quiet and keep to himself when Jesus was in the house. And blind Bartimaeus said, I've heard what he can do. I've seen what he has done. And I believe and I want you to do for me what I've seen and heard you do. He refused to sit down and just shut up. See, that's why it's important for us to testify and tell of what God is doing in our lives. There are always going to be people who only hear about Jesus through you. They won't step foot in the church. They won't hear a sermon. They won't log into Facebook or to YouTube. They won't pull up a streaming service and hear a message about God. But they can hear the message of hope through you. That's why it's important that you and I tell everybody about Jesus. That's why I said early on on this morning, I said, we've got to evangelize. We've got to tell about the goodness of God. Tell about how God's healed you when you were sick. How God saved you when you were lost. Some people need to hear your testimony. And if you sit silent because you don't want to raise your voice or because you don't want to disturb the environment, because you don't want to put yourself out there, then somebody's going to miss their moment to hear about Jesus Christ. Now, I know we don't like accountability, but there are people that God puts in your path and my path for us to share the gospel with. I got two people. 
There are people God's going to put in your path for you to share the gospel with. There's an expectation God has that you're going to share his goodness with them. It's important that we testify, that we tell about what God does. Because those people were put there at that moment, at that time in your life. Because God vested the gospel in you and he wants you to sow it into somebody else. Blind Bartimaeus has, has heard and maybe even seen about Jesus. He wasn't just going to sit back and watch Jesus pass him by. He wasn't going to listen to the onlookers that said, be quiet, sit down, don't make a scene. He said, you know what? He said, I've seen and I've heard. And if i got to shake the whole community, I'm going to shake the community. I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm going to go after the Lord. I'm going to cry out to God. And he begins shouting, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He's, causing, he's pitching a fit. He's raising a ruckus. He's not sitting down. He's not quiet. He's not, be, he's not being well, well demeanored. He said there's healing in the house and I'm going to have healing if I've got to scream at the top of my lungs. If I've got to do whatever i got to do to get Jesus to notice me, I'm going to do whatever i got to do. And he keeps shouting, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, thou son of David, please have mercy on me. And all the while, while he's screaming and while he's shouting, while he's trying to attract the presence of the attention of Jesus, people around him are going, hey, be quiet, shut up, this is church. Sit down. You don't need to be so loud. Why you got to clap so loud? Why you got to sing so loud? See, every, if you see me down front while we worship and constantly doing this right here, it's because I'm making sure my microphone's off. Because I'm going to worship the Lord. Now, the Bible says you make a joyful noise. It didn't say that joyful noise. If it wasn't good, it needed to be amplified. So I make sure that microphone's off. Because I'm singing. I'm praising the Lord. I'm crying. I'm calling on the name of Jesus. And they're saying, Bartimaeus, be quiet. I don't want to hear it. You're disturbing us. I don't want to hear you crying. I don't want to hear you screaming. Just sit down. Shut up and be quiet. But Bartimaeus said, I don't think so. He got so boisterous, so loud and persistent that Jesus stopped what he was doing and said, bring him here. See... They were so concerned about how loud he was calling on the name of Jesus that they wanted him to just sit down and shut up. Just be quiet. This man is blind. And the healer is walking down the road. And instead of ushering him into the presence of Jesus, they're trying to sit him down and shut him up. Can I tell you the purpose of the church is not to tell people to sit down and be quiet and reserve yourself. It is the purpose of the church to say, let me get you to Jesus. Let me take you to the one who has the power to heal your blindness. Let me take you to the one who can save your soul. Our job, our purpose is to lead them to Jesus. Not try to keep them from Jesus. Not try to form them into our image or our mold of what a worshiper looks like. We all don't worship the same. Some of us are quiet, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Some are louder. Some are more boisterous. Some are clappers. Some are hand lifters. Some are jumpers. It's fine. We don't, you know, if we were all the same, it'd be pretty boring. We shouldn't seek to be the same. We shouldn't seek to keep or form people in our image of what worship sounds like or what worship looks like or how we should call on the name of the Lord. They kept trying to settle him down and shut him up. But what he saw was healing. And he wasn't going to let anybody stand in his way of getting to where Jesus was. He couldn't see him. But oh, he knew he was there. He knew he was in the region. He was in the house. He was in the street. He was there. And Bartimaeus said, nothing is going to keep me from calling on the Lord because he's my only hope. I'm blind and I can't see, but I heard he heals the blind. I heard 
heard he raises the dead. I heard he has the power in his hands to fix, to cure, to change what's all wrong in me. He can heal my blinded eyes. Jesus. Oh, Shanda Lomokosita. Jesus. I was blind. I want to see Jesus. I was sick. I want to be healed. Jesus. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. Have mercy on me. And the more he cried, the more they told him to sit down and be quiet. But he cried so loud that it got the attention of Jesus. Let me tell you something. I don't care how many times they tell you to sit down and shut up, you keep calling on Jesus. I don't care how many times they tell you to be quiet, you lift your voice and you call on Jesus. I don't care how many times they tell you to stop praying, you pray and you call on the name of Jesus. Because there is but one name that has the power to do what you need done in your life. And it ain't my name or your name. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Call on the name of the Lord. Mm. Jesus said, hey, he said, bring him over here. See, his persistence got the attention of the Lord. Jesus hearing the constant cries of Bartimaeus said, bring him to me. The onlookers now who were there, they are trying to hush him up and get him to sit down. All of a sudden look at him and they say, hey Bartimaeus, be of good cheer. He's calling you. Jesus has heard you. Jesus is calling you. And Jesus called for him. But Bartimaeus' response was key here. I want you to see something. We'll, we'll miss this. Oftentimes we miss this. We'll pass it by. But in Mark 10 and 50, this is not on the screen, so you're just going to have to look it up for yourself. Mark 10 and 50, it says, and throwing aside his garment, he he rose and came to Jesus. Now we'll miss the importance of that statement. We'll focus on the rose to come to Jesus, but there was something that had to happen before he could. And I want to show it to you this morning. His garment was his identifier. It gave him his right to beg, literally. Literally. The coat that he threw off was called a beggar's garment. He had to wear this when he was begging. It signified to the authorities and to the people that he has the right to beg alms from them by wearing this coat. But Bartimaeus grew weary of his affliction, no longer wanting to be identified by his condition, and he began to cry out to Jesus, and Jesus heard him and said, bring him here, and the first thing Bartimaeus does is, he threw off his coat. He threw off the beggar's garment. He threw off his right to stay where he was. See, some people don't want to ever get better because they want to stay right where they are. Some people don't ever want Jesus to heal them because they want to stay right where they are because it's their identity. It's become who they are. And while Bartimaeus had the identity of a beggar, when Jesus called his name, it changed his identity. And the Bible says he threw off that garment. He threw it off and he stood up and he went to Jesus. See, his garment had identified him, but until he laid down his faulty identity, he couldn't come to Jesus and realize who he was. He couldn't realize his identity in Christ. People may have defined you and told you who you are. But you need to do, all you need to do is throw off the garment they've placed on you. Throw off the garment they've saddled you with. Throw off the garment that they put on your life that says you'll never be anything. That says you'll always be broken. Says you're never going to be useful. You're useless. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares for you. Nobody wants you around. Nobody, nobody, nobody. They've layered garments over your life. And you've worn them as your identity for far too long. And the Lord says that if you will cast off your garment and rise and come to Jesus. That he will heal your afflictions. And he'll minister to your soul. So throw off your garment and run to Jesus. See, you're a child of God. You're not who they say you are. You are who who God calls you. I tell you this all the time, so this is not news. What people say about you is none of your business. Don't worry about it. That's between them and the Lord. You know who you are. If you are secure in who you are in Christ, it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. Let them talk. They'll answer for every word that comes out of their mouth. 
You're going to answer for how you respond to the things of your life. Throw off the garment. Don't allow them to place things on you to identify you. Throw it off and identify who you really are and you're a child of God. Walk in the power of God. Walk in the fullness of His Spirit. Clothe yourself in His righteousness. You don't have to be robed in their names and their tags and their labels over your life. You are who God says you are. You are the redeemed of God. You're a pearl of great price. You are the one whom God shed his blood for. Rise up in your true identity and call yourself who you are. I am a son or I am a daughter of the living God. Let's get back to Peter here before we finish this morning. And the man at the tent at the gate beautiful. There's something I want to something else I want us to see here. He was at the right place at the right time, but he was there for the wrong reason. And Acts 3, verse 3 through 6 says, Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Let Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I, I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now often, we find ourselves in the same place as this man. This man thought he had it figured out. For him, the answer was money. All I need is money. If you'll just give me money, I can live. I can sustain myself. I can continue on. He sat at the entryway of the church begging for money. What he failed to see was that it wasn't the money that he really needed. It wasn't what he thought it was. Oftentimes, what we think we need is not really what we need. What he needed was to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. And how often do we focus on the temporal things that are fleeting and miss what God wants to do for us? How often do we focus on the pain and our suffering? And we want to medicate and we want to touch the pain when God wants to touch the wound and heal the wound and not just alleviate the pain. See, he had determined that money would fix his situation. If he could just get some alms, if he could just get some money from the pastor's buys, it would fix his situation. It would allow him to, to sustain his life. So the, the material possessions would satisfy, and the, but the real need uh, would satisfy the real need of his life, but the real need of his life was to encounter Jesus. He was seeking relief, all the while God wanted to give him a release. Too often we seek relief from our situations. We seek relief from our afflictions when God wants to give you a release. We're just trying to get out of the pain. And God says, no, I want to bring you through and make you whole. We just want to take some Tylenol to alleviate the pain. And God says, I know it's painful. The journey may be difficult. But if you'll just keep walking, it's going to not just eliminate your pain, but it's going to make you whole again. See, God's not interested in just removing pain. He wants to bring healing to your life. Amen. How often do we sit on church pews broken and hurting all the while trying to mask our pain? Through professional conquest or material accolades or acquisitions. Lord, if only I could get that new job or that promotion at work. If only I could buy that new car or if I could just get that new house. Everything in my life would be good. I know that it would fix me. It would help me. And all the while we're, we're living in that new house. We're driving that new car that you bought with that money you got from that promotion that you sacrificed everything for. You've sacrificed church. You've sacrificed your family. you sacrificed people in your life. you sacrificed yourself. Yet you're still crippled. You're still broken. You're still hurting. You're still damaged. The irony is that the man was in the exact place he needed to be but didn't realize that what he sought was a temporary fix and what he needed was a long-term solution. He needed more than just a coin. He needed more than just money. He needed Jesus. And oftentimes we will try to find everything we can to take away our pain. When in reality what we need to do is just get Jesus. We just need to seek the Lord. We need to trust His name. We need to plead on His blood. We need to call on His name. Too often we take time and spend too much effort trying to acquire things to mask our pain. Try to find things to, to acquire things that will soothe our discomfort. When God says, I want to bring you to a place of wholeness and healing. 
He sought money, comfort through money, but you know what? They could have filled his cup till it was overflowing, but you know what wouldn't have changed? He still couldn't walk. They could have gave him enough money that he didn't have to be at that temple for a week, but you know what? The next week he'd have been right back. He couldn't walk. They couldn't have changed his life. See, Peter could have given him all the money in the treasure, but he'd have still been crippled. And Peter said, I can't give you what you want, but I can give you what you need. See, sometimes we just want to put a band-aid on it and we want to cover up the pain. But we medicate the symptoms and never address the real issue. But God is not into band-aids. Listen to me this morning. God is not into temporary fixes for your life. He's not into temporary adjustments. God is into life-changing, course-altering encounters with His glory. God wants you to call on Him this morning. Jesus, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. You say, well, pastor, I called and he didn't answer. Then keep calling. Keep calling. The Bible doesn't tell us that, that Bartimaeus said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us one time. Oh, mercy on me one time. It says he was shouting it. That gives me the picture that he just kept going until he got what he was after. He didn't give up because they told him to be quiet. He didn't give up because they told him there was no hope. He didn't give up because they told him, well, that's just the way it's going to be. You blind. What you going to do about it? You can't change anything about it. Just give up. Just sit down and be quiet. He said, no, as long as there's breath in my body, I've got hope because Jesus is in the house. And as long as he's on the throne, I have hope. And I'm going to call on his name until there's no breath left in my body. Don't give up. Man, that's the easiest thing you can do today is quit, give up, sit down, and just say, oh, well, I guess this is the way my life's going to be. I guess this is the way it has to end or this is the way it has to go. But in reality, Jesus is just waiting on you to call him. There's no indication that Jesus didn't hear him the first time he called him. There's no indication in this Bible that he didn't. Keep calling keep shouting keep praying keep fasting keep calling on the name of the lord because what you need in your life is to encounter the glory of god you need an encounter with jesus can i reassure you in something this morning god will not leave you like he finds you you say but he may never heal your disease but he could certainly heal you you said pastor it don't even make no sense there are blind people that stay blind. There are, there are lame people that stay lame. What Jesus can heal, even if he doesn't heal your affliction, is how you handle your affliction. How you live life with an affliction. All of us are going to go through. Some of us are going to pick things up that we can't lay down, that we can't get off of us. There are some wounds that we're going, they're going to stay with us, but they don't have to fester. And you don't have to live out of the pain of that affliction. You can live a full life in Christ and still not be fully healthy in your body. We don't have to let our sicknesses close our mouths. We don't have to let our tragedies or our trials or our pain silence our worship. We can still call on the name of the Lord. And what you really need, oftentimes isn't what you think it is, it's what God has for you and that's the presence of of his son Jesus in your life. Amen. See, you cannot have a true encounter with Jesus and stay the way you are. If you have encountered Jesus Christ, it's going to change you. It may not change that condition, but it's going to change you. See, Peter could have thrown those coins in that cup and treated his symptoms. But Peter had something more valuable than a momentary fix. He had something more valuable than wealth and more powerful than anything Peter could have physically given him. Peter looked at him and he said, I don't have the money that you're seeking. I don't have the temporary fix that you're desiring. I don't have a band-aid to put over your brokenness. He said, but what I have for you is healing. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now that was the dumb thing to say to a lame man. In your humanity. Look at, look at, he looked at a crippled man and said, I can't give you no money, but won't you stand up? And that don't make sense to us. But see, God has the power to heal, even though he had been that way. This man had never walked. He had never stood up. He had never ran. 
He'd never done any of the things that you and I could take for granted. He had never done it. And Peter looked at him. He said, in the name of Jesus, stand up. Rise up and walk. And in that moment, Peter took him by the hand, lifted him up, and the man began to walk. See, when you allow Jesus to minister to you and give you what you need, rather than just what you're seeking, it can change your life. Quit trying to finagle your way through this life. Quit trying to medicate your symptoms and address the root of the problem. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Stand up. Declare the goodness of God. Don't wait around for man to do for you what only God can do for you. Call on the name of the Lord today. And in His name, stand up and declare victory. In His name, stand up and walk. Live again. Because God is living in you. Listen, you may have come in this house this morning broken, but you can leave here whole today. You don't have to leave like you came. You don't have to go home in the same condition you came in. You can leave whole. You can leave with the touch of God on your life. You may have come in here today discouraged and you're hurting and you're broken. But you can leave here today healed and filled with the eternal hope of Jesus Christ. It's not over. You're not finished. You're not through. It's not done. There's still hope for you and the hope is Jesus Christ. But you've got to call on His name. Don't let Him pass by. Don't just sit there quietly. While other people worship. Don't just sit there quietly while other people call on him. But raise your voice. Raise your voice. And cry out to Jesus. Oh Jesus thou son of David. Have mercy on me O Lord. Have mercy on me O Lord. You see there's power in Jesus name. It hasn't diminished Over 2,000 years since the crucifixion on the cross, the death, the payment, the penalty, the suffering, the shame, the burial, the resurrection. But guess what? It's still just as powerful today as that first drop that hit the ground at the foot of his cross. That blood is still flowing today. And it's just as powerful today as it was over 2,000 years ago. And when you speak his name, there's power. There's authority. Not going to be any of mine, so don't speak my name. It's not going to be any in yours. But if you'll call on the name of Jesus Christ, there's power in his name. There's authority in his name. At his name, sickness is healed. At his name, demons flee. At his name, principalities and powers are brought down. At his name, you can be made whole today. But only by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain over your life today. That's all it takes is Jesus. It ain't who prays for you. It ain't how many times they oil your head up. You can pour that ball of oil all over your head. It don't make a difference unless Jesus touches your life. There's power in the name of Jesus to heal your body today. There's power in the name of Jesus to transform your mind. There's power in the name of Jesus to renew your spirit. And there's power in the name of Jesus to give you a new identity this morning your afflictions your tragedies and your sufferings do not have to be your identity if you'll call on the name of the Lord Jesus can change your identity today he can bring wholeness and healing to you he can walk you through the valleys he'll comfort you while you're crying he'll hold you up when you don't feel like you can stand up and all you gotta do Is call on the name of the Lord. Stand with me this morning. I'm done. You don't have to leave like you came today. You don't have to go home broken. You don't have to go home carrying that pain. You don't have to go home feeling as though the world is on top of you and there's no hope in your life because there is hope and it's Jesus Christ. And all you have to do today is call on the name of the Lord. That's all you have to do. So I'm going to open these altars right now. And if you need God to minister to your life, I want you to come. I want you to call on the name of the Lord. I want you to rise up and I want you to walk. If you can't walk from where you are, get somebody to gather around you where you are. But if you can walk to this altar, I want you to walk. Because Jesus wants to minister to you today. 
He wants to touch your life. But you've got to rise up and walk. You've got to call on the name of the Lord. So that all who will call on the name of the Lord. That he may minister to you today. These altars are open. It's up to you. Father, we thank you today for your faithfulness. We thank you today for your goodness. Oh, we trust your name, Lord. Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on your people today. Have mercy on this church today. Have mercy on us today, oh, Lord. Have mercy on our community. Oh, you're faithful, God. You're faithful. You're faithful. And we're grateful for all that you have done for us. Now, Lord, we come and we call on your name today. Lord, that you might heal our brokenness this morning. That if there's pain in our bodies, whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual, that God, your hand of healing would be on each of us today. Lord, let us not just sit quietly and endure the afflictions. But in the name of Jesus, let us rise up and walk this morning. Let us rise up and walk this morning. Let us rise up and walk this morning. In the name of Jesus, may the power of the Holy Spirit begin to heal, begin to deliver, begin to set free. Break every chain, Lord. Break every chain. Lord, break every chain today. In the name of Jesus, let us rise up and walk. Let us call on the name of the Lord. And may you minister to the hearts, minds, and bodies of your people today, Lord. We worship you, Father. Grateful. With grateful hearts, we thank you this morning. With grateful hearts, we thank you this morning. For, Lord, you are good. And your mercies endure forever. Healing, God. Restoration, Lord. Strength, Lord. Direction, Lord. Anointing, Lord. God, may you do what only you can do today. May you do what only you can do today. May you heal what needs to be healed. May you do what needs to be done. Lord, we're not asking for a short-term fix. We're asking for a solution. A release, Lord. Not relief. Oh, God, I feel that. But a release. In the name of Jesus, Lord, send your power. Send your power that's vested in your name by your blood. Send your power to break every chain, every hindrance, every sickness, every binding. Everything the enemy has set against your people today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, let us rise up and walk. Let us run to you today. Let us run to you today. Lord, casting off every chain, casting off every garment that people in life has placed over us. We are not who they say we are. We are sons and daughters of God. You're our inheritance. We are yours. We are yours and we are loved, God. By your power, Lord, speak healing. By your power, speak strength and restoration. Mm, Let peace, let peace come. Let peace come where there's trouble. Where there's sorrow, let there be rejoicing. Where there's sickness, let there be healing. Oh, shandala moko sita yidala maha ye shete la maanda. Ye shete ko shandala ma sita yiyayota la ha. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let us rise up and run to you today that your will might be done. That we might celebrate the goodness of your presence and the goodness of your touch today. Father, we are grateful and we are thankful for you today. You're so good, Lord. You're so good. Thank you for ministering to your people. Thank you for reminding us this morning that life may be life, but we don't have to live any less than you have for us to live. That we don't have to wear name tags and labels that life has placed on us. But we can be who you've called us to be. And that's a son and a daughter of Jesus. A son and daughter of the Lord God Almighty. Joint heirs with Christ to the kingdom of God. We're king's kids. We're royalty, Lord. Because you're our father. 
You're our hope and our strength. Let us leave here today and not forget, Lord. Not forget that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. No longer bound, no longer labeled, no longer restrained, but we're free to run, to sing, to worship, to evangelize, to tell of the goodness of God, and to love you as you have loved us, to love others as you have loved us, that you might receive the glory and you might receive the honor. Now, Father, as we leave here this morning, don't let us leave this moment. Don't let us leave this ministry, this time that you have stopped by just to hear us and to touch us. But let us take you with us today. Go with us, O Lord. Go before us. Chart the course, the path for each of us. That on our journey of life, that we might constantly call upon the name of the Lord that you might show us mercy and show us grace. Oh Lord, we give you all the praise and all the worship and all the honor. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. I'm praying for you. Continue to pray as long as you need to. I pray the Lord will bless you. He'll minister to you. That the healing power of God will be upon you today. May you go in the power and the spirit of the Lord today. May the Lord bless you.